and welcome to the Chez Toi podcast on Paris Underground Radio. I'm Emily Monaco, fungus expert and professional consumer of cheese. And I'm your resident wine expert, Caroline Connor. And we both live in France, where wine and cheese are cornerstones of almost every meal, from the day-to-day to the extraordinary. At Chez Toi, we feature recipes submitted by home cooks like you and pair them with the perfect wine and the most complimentary cheese. This week's recipe comes to us from Denise Powers. She's sharing her Zuppa de Faro, or Faro soup, with barlotta beans, spelt, and spices. This week's recipe is a comforting pasta fagioli from Joanna Farrell. I grew up in a family of very good cooks on my mom's side. They emigrated to New York City from Shaka, a fishing town on Sicily's southwestern coast in the 1920s. Everyone just knew how to cook and had an appreciation, a reverence for good food. As tight as money may have been at times, they never skimped on quality ingredients for their thrice daily meals eaten at the table as a massive extended family unit. My mother's stoic relatives expressed the love that they weren't able to verbalize through their cooking, imploring everyone in the dining room to eat, eat more, as the food at the table was their love laid out for the family to see. My mother, while as affectionate as they come, inherited both that philosophy and that innate ability to cook. I was lucky enough to get my mom's home cooking every night as a kid. She could make Italian classics as effortlessly as she breathed, from Sunday sauce with brajol, homemade meatballs and sausage, to pasta fagiole, a simple cannellini bean and pasta soup with few ingredients, a peasant dish really, but so much more than the sum of its parts. It's uncanny how much flavor a few vegetables, beans, and tomato paste can impart in a soup. The flavor is inimitable, and when I'm sad, cold, tired, or stressed, I can make a pot in less than 25 minutes. And as I sit down with a bowl, dump far more Pecorino Romano cheese than socially acceptable on top, just as I did in my early years, I'm a kid bellying up to the kitchen table again, ready to enjoy not just a meal, but the love of generations of Frisch's and Chiarello's prior, the Sicilian hug in a bowl. All right. Well, thank you so much, Joanna, for sending us that recipe. And Joanna actually is my oldest friend in the entire world. We've been friends since we were like three years old. And we have actually been cooking and eating together for a very long time as well. So it was kind of cool to get this recipe for uh, pasta fagiole. Her mom used to cook for us all the time when we were growing up. So I am very familiar with uh, this kind of meal. And oddly enough, before I really understood what was good and what was not good, Joanna and I used to try and have cooking shows together, but we weren't allowed to use the stovetop. So we would just (laughs) mix raw pasta with whatever condiments and spices we could find in the spice cupboard. And I don't think it was very good for the digestion. But, um, you know, we learned how to to talk about food, I guess. I don't think we're making any sense. That's so funny. I used to, I had a friend that I would like, quote unquote, cook with, but it just meant like, we would just put stuff in the food processor. And we would like, we would just put like Oreos and like butter in the food processor. And that was us cooking. I mean, that sounds delicious. I would cook like that. Let's do it. Yeah, it's great. (laughs) I love this. And I feel like there is actually a theme on a lot of the recipes that we get, which is that it's just comfort food, you know? Yeah. It's just, this is like fancy mac and cheese. Yeah. And like, it actually kind of reminded me like, you know, when she, it's this like lovely, delicious soup with. Joanna says to put a big old pile of grated pecorino cheese on top, which is this Italian sheep's milk cheese that was really popular during lockdown because people kept making cacio e pepe, which is, mm-hmm. you know, basically Roman mac and cheese. You know, did you did you jump on that trend, Caroline? Did you make cacio e pepe? It's not my favorite. I make what I use pecorino for, and I do this a lot, is I make aglio olio peperoncino. Ooh. And that is literally garlic and olive oil with with like chili flakes and lots of pecorino and it's so good it sounds really good it's so easy okay so that's what's so great about like you were saying like comfort food and i am all about cheese obviously but cheese specifically like a cheese with this much flavor you don't need that much else like it seasons everything for you Mm -hmm. yeah it's so salty yeah and this recipe in particular, you know, with, you know, it's got like that hearty sort of tomatoey broth. It's got the noodles, it's got the beans, and it's got already cheese built into it. For me, it got me thinking about Italian sheep's milk cheeses in general. And then about one in particular, which is kind of a recent discovery of mine, which is called Marzolino Rosso, which is a Tuscan sheep's milk cheese Ooh. that has this really beautiful reddish rind. 
But even though we have like tons of these sort of orangey rinded cheeses in France, these washed rind cheeses, this one's actually a little different because the outside of the cheese is rubbed in tomato puree. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. It's so Italian. It's so Italian. Now, it also doesn't add any real flavor to it. It it kind of, it protects the rind because it's got acid in it naturally and it gives it this beautiful color. But in reality, the cheese ends up just kind of having this like really nice, like buttery, nutty character. Um, doesn't taste tomatoey at all. It's beautiful. But it does have this kind of slightly bitter finish almost. And that's thanks to the fact that it's made using a vegetarian rennet that's derived from thistles. So you get that kind of like slight acidity, which is nice to balance out all of that like nutty richness. And it's mature and it's intense, which means that I think, I mean, despite tomato rubbing or not, I think it would marry really nicely with a tomato-based soup like this one. And I think it could even go with a red wine. But I don't know what you had in mind for your pairing with this soup, but I think it might be one of those few cheeses that doesn't get overpowered by red wine. Oh, well, I was definitely thinking reds. And so okay. I'm happy about that. But before we dive into that, can I ask you a little bit about this whole rennet situation? Yeah. Because I'm curious, you know, for something like this, which is like a protected cheese, right? Uh, protected? I'm not sure. I think it's just a, a name. Hang on. I'm going to ask the internet. Internet, is Marcelina Rosso protected? Because then if it's not, is it like just one brand and they use the vegetarian rennet or is like the vegetarian rennet something that they have to use? You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So um, internet tells me basically that the, so it is a protected cheese and that it can, it's often made with vegetable rennet. So I guess some brands are going to make it with vegetable rennet from thistles and some will not. But if you ever, you know, keep an eye out for vegetarian, a vegetarian label on your cheese, that then you can be pretty sure that it's going to be made with vegetarian rennet. Otherwise it'll be made with animal rennet. So good question. So if you want to make sure you want to look for a Marcelina Rosso that has a vegetarian label on it. But some of them okay. are, I guess, still made with, with animal rennet. So there we go. Interesting. Thank yeah. you. Cool. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm always interested in, in stuff like that. I mean, I think a lot of people don't even realize that a lot of cheese is not vegetarian, which I think we have talked about before. Yeah, we have, but it bears, men- it bears you know, reiterating because I think a lot of the time on a vegetarian dish, uh, you know, the one vegetarian option in a restaurant is going to have a lot of cheese on it. And there are very few cheeses, especially very few traditional French cheeses that are vegetarian, naturally, like there are some industrial ones that are vegetarian, for sure. And I think in the UK, we've talked about this before as well, given like the widespread vegetarian, like there's a bigger, a, a very big established vegetarian population in the UK. So there's a lot of vegetarian cheese there as a result. But I think, yeah, by default, cheese is not necessarily vegetarian. Yeah. And you know what? Wine is not either. Oh, well, there we go. A lot of wine is, is fined using non-vegetarian ingredients. And what fining is, it's basically adding something to the wine that then binds with cloudy particles and then they remove it again. So I think if you're a vegetarian, it depends on how strict you are. Like it, it doesn't, it's not staying in your wine, but they're using it in the process. And they use albumin, which comes from eggs. They use casein, which comes from dairy. They use gelatin, which comes from obviously hooves and stuff. And then they also often use something called icing glass, which is derived from fish. So these days, I think more more and more producers are avoiding those fining agents. And they're using stuff like bentonite clay and maybe finer filters. But it's definitely it's definitely interesting. There, there really isn't a lot of transparency about it. But it is, I think it's particularly, it can be tough on vegans. Yeah. And it really does come down to, I mean, like that whole flexitarian mindset, right? Like you're making, you're always trying to make the better choice and not letting perfect be the enemy of best or however we want to um, poorly, poorly quote Voltaire. But I, I, if I'm avoiding, I tend to avoid meat unless I really know where it's coming from. But at the end of the day, you're making a choice, you know, and if you have like a really lovely artisanal cheese that's made with animal rennet, but you know where the animals were raised and you know they were raised humanely versus a vegetarian cheese made with vegetarian rennet, but it's produced industrially and you don't know if the animals were raised in like a sad concrete barn and if they've ever seen grass before. Like personally for me, I would pick the uh, the animal rennet cheese any any day of the week, but I'm not a vegetarian. So it's all down to down to you and your reasoning and, and why you choose to avoid certain products to begin with. 
I think it's it's really interesting, you know, especially being in France, like we are so lucky that we have access to really good quality meat and dairy, but it's expensive. You know, it's super expensive. Like I, I don't eat a ton of meat because meat is so expensive. But when I do go get meat, I'm not going to the grocery store. Not that the grocery store has bad meat necessarily. A lot of, you know, a lot of the, the meat in France is French and it, and it is held to a really high standard. But if I'm going to my butcher, like I know that those people know those cows. Like he literally buys like one cow at a time, you know, and, and like from a specific farm. And there are these beautiful, you know, beautiful local cows that like seem to be pretty happy. But it is, you know, I think that we can all agree that there is an answer in eating less meat in general and being, you know, more aware of where your food comes from and, and just we're all doing our best, right? A hundred percent. Like, I mean, I, yeah, I at this point eat very little meat, but when I do, it's always, you know, something that some, you know, I'm either eating it in a restaurant where I really trust the the staff to be sourcing responsibly. One of my favorite restaurants in in Paris is a a restaurant called Le Saint Sebastien, where the they get their capons from this farm where they raise them and feed them the spent grain from the restaurant owner's husband's brewery. And it's this like little closed circle. And they're basically, I mean, they're the fattest, happiest capons in the entire world. And it's that whole like- Yeah, can you please tell our audience what a capon is? <laughs> oh, a capon, a capon is a castrated rooster. It's a really, really fat, luxurious, delicious chicken. I, oh my God, my mother's going to kill me if she hears this. I don't like turkey. <laughs> I think it's always dry. Yeah, it's, it's And I love having a capon at Thanksgiving instead. It's so delicious. Can you get those in America? Yeah, you can. You have to kind of, spe- you have to special order them. Like, you know, you have to go to one of those like meat cooperatives, but you can get them or like a guinea hen. Like there's something del- really delicious and it's like a, li- a smaller bird. You don't, you aren't going to be eating capon for like 15 days <laughs> afterwards. And that is the problem with turkey. Right. So I don't know, like if you know where your meat is coming from and it's that whole like one bad day mentality where it's like they've been very, very happy. And then on one day, they're a little less happy for 30 seconds. I I can get behind that principle myself. I mean, this is a controversial opinion perhaps, but I'm, I studied archaeology at at Oxford. That's what I did. And, you know, we learned about domestication. Like a lot of these animals literally exist because we eat them. Yeah. And so it's, right. it's complicated, but we do our best. <laughs> we do do our best. And I think there's very little reasoning. Like when you look at something like a lentil that you can grow and it's a protein and it's delicious, I don't think there's really any reason in this day and age with the climate being in the state that it's in for us to be factory raising steers for the, for human consumption. Yeah, like it's really I, sad. there's no real reason to do it. But like I went out, you know, to I go out to visit these like farmers who are making cheese and and you have, you know, they know all of their cows and the cows know them and they seem very happy. And I mean, I, I'm not a cow mind reader, but they look pretty darn happy. Yeah. So yeah, you should work on being a cow mind reader. That'd be fun. That's, that's my next plan. You know, when I get it, when I get a career step for you, when I get a second in my life, I'm going to start learning how to read the minds of cows. Perfect. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Chez Toi. I want to grow lentils now. Now I'm like, what does a lentil plant even look like? It's like a little bush. It's like, yeah, it's like a little bean plant. Well, speaking of beans, how about I pair some wine with this? Oh, (laughs) yeah. Let's get some wine. Let's get some wine. Yeah, I need some wine after this intense conversation. (laughs) <laughs> um, I'm going to say Montepulciano d'Abruzzo. We're going to stay in Italy. Nice. And Montepulciano d'Abruzzo is a really good option. Um, it comes from the Abruzzo area of Italy. And it is not to be confused with Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, which is a Sangiovese-based wine from Tuscany. What we are looking for is it's actually the the grape is Montepulciano. So there's, there's an appellation... Uh, in Tuscany that is called Montepulciano, but it's Sangiovese grape. And then there's Montepulciano di Abruzzo, which is the Montepulciano grape coming from Abruzzo. And this is a wine that is pretty popular right now. It's a big, I mean, it's pretty cheap. It's pretty widely available. It's a really like yummy, juicy, you know, dark fruit red. And it's from this like, you know, warm climate that has really drinkable reds. They can, it's really like 
you know, juicy and there's some pepperiness, some herbiness. They're, they're variable in terms of, of price and quality. That is for sure. Like you can get ones that are really cheap, but you can also get ones that are a bit nicer, but they just tend to be easy crowd pleasing wines. And I think it works with this because it, again, it's about like weeknight comfort food. I think that something red is, is going to be good to like balance the tomato vibes and the beans too. Like beans have this really nice kind of protein texture. And I think the tannins, a little bit of medium tannins on that is going to be really nice. Awesome. And now, okay, I feel like an idiot, but bear with me. So when I go into like any restaurant and I order a glass of Montepiciano, are they giving me the one that you talked about, the one with the Sangiovese grapes, or are they giving me this? I think they're probably going to be giving you the Montepulciano de Bruzzo at this point. Okay. Okay. So if I liked that, will I like this or is it completely different things? They're totally different. Okay. But probably, I mean, we like, we like everything, right? We like everything. That's yeah. true. Okay. Um, this is cool. the one that kind of goes with everything. So it's a really good option for like an everyday red. Nice. And do you think that that's the kind of wine that could go with a with a cheese, or is it going to be too like tannic to to really hang out with cheese? No, I think it would be great with your sheep's cheese. That sounds really yummy with a little tomato vibes. No, it'll be fine. I mean, I think I wouldn't necessarily want to drink that with like super super fresh goat cheese. Yeah, but you know the cheese you chose, the cheese you chose. Mm-hmm. That's the name of your. <laughs> that's the name of your book. <laughs> that is the name of my book. I want I that choose. on a T-shirt. The cheese I choose. I choose my cheese. I choose my cheese. Um, I think that that it would be quite nice with that. Yeah, why not? Because that's got a little bit of age on it, right? It's not super, super fresh. No, no, that's got a little bit of age on it. It's got this kind of like lacy, little tiny light holes through it. It's really, it's really nice. It's kind of funky. It's got some personality. And like, yeah, with, you know, with a soup that, like you said, it has the beans, it's got the tomatoes, you know, you, you don't want anything that's going to fade into the background. So sounds like this is a very happy a very happy Italian marriage. Perfect. On the, a three-way Italian marriage. I love it. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Joanna, for sending in your recipe. And listeners, what is uh, keeping you so quiet? Get your get your recipes on here. Um, f- send us a voice clip. Uh, you can reach us at parisundergroundradio at gmail.com. Send us your quirkiest, weirdest, uh, most comforting, most out there recipes, whatever you like. Um, and we will pair it with our favorite cheeses and wines um, and hopefully give you some ideas on how you can make your home cooked meals a little more extravagant. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joanna and listeners. We hope to get your recipes soon. To learn more about the recipe feature today and to see photos of the meal, please go to parisundergroundradio.com. To have your recipe featured in an upcoming episode of Chez Toi, please email us at parisundergroundradio at gmail.com. You can find me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find me, Caroline Connor, at Wine Dine Caroline on all the things. This episode was produced by Paris Underground Radio. The music is A Night Alone by Track Tribe. For more about the Chez Toi podcast and podcasts like it, please go to parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and bon appetit. <laughs>